So Tim uh, did his PhD in uh, at Max Planck Institute, just to give an introduction, uh, at Max Planck Institute in Dusseldorf. He then did uh, a few postdoc, he held a few postdoc positions at, uh, at Eindhoven University in, the, in applied physics and uh, at UCL in chemistry. Following that, he moved to Edinburgh as a chancellor's fellow and in 2013, in 2018, he's become, uh, he, he was made a lecturer in chemical engineering and at Edinburgh, uh, at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, recently, he's become a reader at the School of Engineering at the University of Edinburgh. His uh, specialty is in lattice Boltzmann modeling, especially for uh, complex fluids. And I guess he's gonna tell us more about blood flows today and uh, his views and share his views and expertise on microscopic blood flow modeling. The floor is Zoom is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Sepete, for the introduction. Um, I am trying to share my screen now. Let me, sorry, just to let everyone know, you can ask your, all your questions after Tim is finished with his talk by raising your hand. So. Yeah, over to you, sorry. Thank you very much for the invitation and I'm very happy to give this talk. During these times, it's, um, it's strange to do everything from the kitchen table, but uh, I hope that I can share a bit of uh, interesting science with you today. Um, the topic of my presentation is uh, blood flow modeling, in particular with a view um, to um, what we can do about blood flow modeling in the human body. The presentation is to some extent about what we have done in the past, what we're working on, but I also want to keep a strong emphasis on outlook because I think these presentations should always engage the audience and um, uh, tell them about open problems and uh, point them in interesting directions. Uh, right, so I'm in engineering in Edinburgh and um, I want to share this uh, lovely picture of Edinburgh with you. I don't know how many of you have been to Edinburgh. Uh, Leeds is relatively close, but um, I have no idea who exactly is in the audience. And uh, some of you may never have been in Scotland. Edinburgh always looks like this. It's always sunny here in Scotland. <laughs> no, it's of course not, but um, uh, this picture has been taken on a fortunate day, I guess, and uh, it's a very nice city uh, to work in and uh, definitely worth a visit. So whenever you come to Scotland, um, uh, come to Edinburgh and uh, take a look at the city. It's very beautiful. Um, to give you an overview of what my group is working on, um, I typically say that uh, there are three pillars of projects and three different main activities. One of them is microfluidics modeling, which you see on the left. And this could be, uh, for example, separation of particles, modeling of uh, microfluidic devices. So this is more about um, artificial geometries. In the middle, you see blood flow. And um, of course, microfluidics is also related to blood flow. But what I mean by the column in the middle, this is more about blood flow applications relevant to um, the human body. And on the right, you can see complex flows, which is a word that is summarizing everything else, basically, because in principle, if you think about it, uh, complex flow is everything that has some kind of complexity by definition. And um, what you see in these uh, pictures is, for example, um, a soft particle at a fluid-fluid interface at the top, or a ternary system where you have more than two fluid components, in this case, three fluid components, and you can do some interesting physics with that. Uh, and all that is summarized as uh, complex flows here. But in the presentation today, I really want to focus on the middle column, blood flow in particular in um, geometries that are relevant to our body. And uh, that is the structure of my presentation. Of course, uh, you will see a short introduction. I would say a bit, not too much, but just a bit about the numerical model. And of course, if you have more questions about that, uh, we have time at the end. There are two main examples I want to share with you today. 
um, red blood cells in bifurcations and red blood cells in networks. And of course, uh, there's a bit of an outlook at the end. In terms of introduction, um, why is it all important what we are doing? Why should we care about blood flow? Uh, probably if you don't have any diseases or health issues related to blood flow, you may not be that interested in blood flow. But typically, uh, once the blood doesn't flow as it should, then suddenly people get interested in it. And uh, that is exactly what is happening in the research landscape these days. There's a huge interest nowadays in an understanding of blood, blood flow, and the relation to disease. For example, we could talk about cancer. We could talk about diabetes, malaria, all kinds of diseases that are somehow related to blood flow. I remember when I started my PhD uh, about 10 years ago and a bit more than 10 years ago. And um, uh, at that time, every thing that people did with blood flow simulation, so that was rheology of blood in a simple shear flow, right? You put a number of blood cells together, you put them in a box, you shear them, you measure viscosity and you see what happens. I mean, that is interesting, but it doesn't really answer pressing questions. And nowadays we are much more sophisticated as a, a research community working with blood flow simulations. And uh, the key questions to answer are really, what is the role of blood flow and blood cell dynamics in disease? Just to give you a few examples here, if you look at the bottom, uh, one of the images is health and the other one is disease. On the left, you see my retina. I went to an eye check uh, last year, I think, um, definitely before the lockdown. And um, the doctor showed me this uh, picture of my luckily healthy retina. And I said, oh, you have to send this to me. I have to show this in, in a research presentation. So here you, you have it as well. Um, you can see, if you look carefully, a few blood vessels in, in my retina. Uh, that is an example of a healthy geometry. And uh, if you look at the bottom right, then you can see that um, if there's a solid tumor growing, then you can imagine that this tumor may actually exert pressure on blood vessels. And these blood vessels get compressed, at least partially compressed. And the question is, what does it do to the distribution of blood flow uh, of, of blood cells? And um, does it maybe have an effect on the way blood cells uh, move in a network of blood vessels? At the top, you see uh, something very interesting, and I'm quite a excited about that. We have just started a project with Manchester and I can also see that at least one collaborator is in the audience, um, Oliver. Um, you see the arterial tree of um, a placenta and that's basically, um, you can see at the bottom, uh, the major blood vessels that are going to the umbilical cord of the, um, the baby, the unborn baby. And the question is, um, what happens in certain diseases of uh, pregnancy? Can you learn from looking at the structure of the placenta? Can you learn uh, something about um, the disease? And is there anything that can be done about the disease? So how is structure and function, how are they related? And what is the role of blood cell dynamics in this? Um, it is definitely very important for us to remember what the scales are in blood flow. And this is um, something I tell all my PhD students and postdocs and uh, undergraduate students, whenever you want to do some modeling, in particular computational modeling, but modeling in general, you have to be very much aware of the assumptions you have and to the assumptions you have to make. What you see in this diagram is on the x-axis, the typical diameter of a blood vessel in the human body. And on the y-axis, you have the typical flow velocity or Reynolds number. And here you can see that there are roughly um, three orders of magnitude that are covered by the diameters. If you start at the bottom left, you can see um, that it's an artificial geometry, but um, the capillaries in the human body have a similar diameter of maybe four or five micrometers, but a red blood cell has a diameter of eight micrometers which means it has to deform strongly in order to be able to squeeze through the capillaries. And that is actually facilitating the oxygen transfer between the red blood cell, because red blood cells carry oxygen, and the tissue surrounding the capillaries. 
this oxygen transfer is diffusion limited and the red blood cells have to be in close contact with the tissue in order to transfer the oxygen to the tissue effectively. So um, the capillaries are maximizing the contact area between the red blood cell and the surrounding tissue. And basically all the oxygen transfer in the body happens in the smallest blood vessels in the capillaries. Now, if you look at the top right, you can see um, a scan where, uh, where bigger blood vessels are visible and these blood vessels have diameters of 10 millimeters or even larger. So we're talking about three, maybe nearly four uh, orders of magnitude in difference of blood vessel diameters. And then the typical velocity of blood cells or blood in the blood vessel ranges between about one millimeter per second in the capillaries up to one meter per second in the aorta, for example. And why is it important for blood flow modeling? Why am I showing you this? Um, you can see that there's a bit of text added to the, to the images, and that is basically telling you which assumptions you can make for the modeling. For example, if you look at the larger scale, quite often you can get away with a single phase, non-Newtonian, or even a Newtonian model for blood, and you completely ignore the red blood cells. You just say, well, I have a liquid. This liquid is um, homogeneous, and uh, the viscosity is roughly constant, and that is telling me everything I want to know. For example, about wool shear stresses in larger blood vessels, um, uh, in the aorta in particular, or uh, carotid artery, or whatever. But if you are interested more in blood flow in the organs, then obviously you have to go down the scales. You have to go to smaller blood vessels because all the tissue, sorry, all the nutrient exchange happens in the smaller blood vessels. And this is what the organs are basically there for. There's a lot of nutrient exchange. So if you go to smaller blood vessel diameters, what you will see is the scale separation between red blood cell diameter and blood vessel diameter is less uh, pronounced. And at some point, the red blood cell diameter is comparable to the diameter of the blood vessel. And in this case, you can certainly not say that you have a homogeneous suspension. And in fact, you will see that later in my presentation, you have quite a, a heterogeneous suspension and the details of the distribution of the blood cells in the blood vessel can determine, and they do determine, uh, where the blood cells go, for example, in a bifurcation. I mean, you can, you cannot have a network of blood vessels without bifurcations, obviously. And um, what happens at these bifurcations? How do you know how many blood cells go to the left or to the right branch? Uh, this is, of course, determined by the flow physics, and it is heavily dominated by uh, confinement effects, in particular in the smaller blood vessels. And the holy grail of blood flow modeling, in my opinion, is because you, you don't want to describe blood flow in an organ all on the microscopic level. I mean, you would have to consider all existing blood vessels in an organ, which is way too expensive, even if you had uh, the best uh, scaling computer code. Um, it would not be practical to run simulations on a regular basis that show you um, the behavior of every single red blood cell. So what you really want to do is you want to develop microscopic laws, reduced order models that give you, let's say simplified, but accurate descriptions of how blood flow behaves in a, in a given organ, for example. And uh, what we want to do is we want to extract rules, microscopic laws or rules from heterogeneous microscopic rules. Or we look at how does blood flow on the micro scale, we try to understand the flow physics and we try to scale that up in order to get rid of the micro scale simulations in the far future, basically. So we don't want to run whole body simulations on the micro scale. We really want to have reliable models. And just to give an example, the Navier-Stokes equation. The Navier-Stokes Navier equation is exactly that. Um, all the effect of the molecules colliding and bumping into each other in a liquid or in a gas, they are all described essentially by the viscosity term in, in the Navier-Stokes equation. Nobody would run routinely a molecular dynamic simulation for a fluid flow problem on the macro scale. Even if you could, you wouldn't do it because uh, you don't have to. You have reliable models on the macro scale, Navier-Stokes, that can do that for you. But how do you go from MD to Navier-Stokes? That is basically the same thing that we want to do here, but for blood flow. Let's talk a bit about the numerical model. And 
um, by numerical model, I mean the model on the micro scale. Um, so everything I'm talking about today is really the simulation of blood flow in smaller blood vessels. And we hope to extract useful laws that can later be applied to the macroscopic uh, behavior of organs, for example. So what you definitely need is you need a flow solver. You need some kind of fluid solver because blood consists of about 55% water you have 45% red blood cells. And the red blood cells are filled with another liquid. They don't have a nucleus, so they're filled with hemoglobin solution, um, which means without a fluid solver, it is very difficult to actually understand the flow physics of a red blood cell suspension. Um, and by membrane solver, um, which you can, can see here, um, by membrane solver, I mean I need a functioning model for the red blood cell membrane. You can imagine that the red blood cell that you can see here on the right, it is a very thin membrane compared to its diameter. Thickness is a few nanometers. And this membrane is highly elastic. It allows the red blood cell to deform very strongly in, in the, microcirc uh, in the um, microcirculation. And um, this kind of behavior, the elastic deformation of a red blood cell has to be captured to an accurate, sufficiently accurate level in order to understand how red blood cells behave in complex uh, geometries. And of course, both aspects of the flow and the membrane, they have to be coupled together because they don't live in isolation. Obviously, a red blood cell is advected by the flow, but the presence of a red blood cell is changing the flow field. Uh, and this is where the coupling comes in. What we are using here in Edinburgh um, is one particular choice of fluid solver, membrane solver, and coupling. I'm not saying that you should use exactly these methods we are using. This is one particular choice. It's our um, numerical model, and other people elsewhere in the world use different models for that. For the fluid solver, we use lattice Boltzmann. Um, it's an Eulerian method, which means we have a, we have a grid, a stationary grid, like the cube you can see here. And at each grid point, we solve for the flow field using lattice Boltzmann. For the red blood cell membrane, we are using a finite element approach. That is a Lagrangian approach because the red blood cells are actually moving in space. We are keeping track of the mesh of a red blood cell while it is moving. And of course, we can have many red blood cells at the same time. And for the coupling of both, lattice Boltzmann on the, on the lattice and uh, the moving boundaries, we use uh, the inverse boundary method. And just to give you a bit of um, additional detail, what, uh, what goes into this model, for the red blood cell membrane, we need to understand a bit what the physics is. Um, you can imagine that the red blood cell membrane is quite thin. It's basically a two-dimensional membrane that is closed on, in itself. So it's, um, it's containing uh, a liquid volume inside, it's, but it's, uh, it's basically a two-dimensional sheet, which is curved, and um, it has certain energy contributions, elastic energy contributions, which can be par parameterized by um, a strain modulus, an area dilation modulus, and a bending modulus. And this is one approach how you can do it. Other people use um, a spring network model, but uh, in the end, as long as you show that your red blood cell deformation is basically the same in a specific uh, benchmark case, it doesn't really matter which model you use. In this particular case, we use a finite element approach where we say, okay, we have an elastic material that has three different moduli. We, uh, the model is actually a bit more complicated than that, but the key takeaway message here is that you uh, can change the shear elasticity of a red blood cell membrane. It's uh, the resistance to shearing, uh, to dilation. It is, uh, red blood cell is basically incompressible in terms of um, area deformation, and uh, you have a bending resistance. So if you imagine you bend a red blood cell and the bilayer uh, that forms the membrane, then uh, that has some kind of finite bending resistance. The good thing is that these parameters are known from experiments. So you can just go there, you look at the papers that are cited here on, on the slide, and um, you just look up the, the parameters and um, uh, you can check what the current um, consensus is regarding the values of these parameters. So that is relatively easy. Um, in terms of coupling, immerse boundary method, uh, the only thing you really have to take away here is uh, you have a lattice that is fixed in space and the fluid lives on that lattice. So the fluid is of course uh, moving, but it's only captured at lattice nodes. 
and you have a membrane that can deform and move in space and you need to communicate between the two. And there's a two-dimensional communication. In one direction, it's called interpolation. This is where um, each Lagrangian node is asking all lattice nodes in the vicinity, what is your velocity? So you interpolate the velocity at the membrane. And um, the forces you can compute with the finite element model, these forces are communicated to the fluid. And then we're using basically Newton's third law. Um, that is saying that if there's a force acting on the membrane, there should be a force acting on the fluid, right? And this force is spread to the fluid using the so-called force spreading. And for that, you have an interpolation sensor. And that is really everything I want to say about this. Uh, you have noticed I, I didn't say anything about the lattice Boltzmann method. Um, of course, I could say much, much more about that, but uh, it would take too much time, I guess. And um, I'm just uh, checking the time, okay. Uh, so if, if you have uh, any questions about the lattice Boltzmann method, we should do that after the presentation. Okay, so uh, we now have a model that um, describes software blood cells in flow. And the question is, what can we do with this model? What, what can we do in terms of science? And here, um, I want to give you two examples. One is the red blood cells in bifurcations and one is the red blood cells in, in networks. And um, uh, I'm very proud uh, that I have an, a, a long and ongoing collaboration with uh, Miguel Bernabeu, who is also here in Edinburgh. He's in medicine. And um, it's, it's a very nice example of a, um, um, a win-win situation. He has more of a biological background and medical background, and uh, I'm a physicist, and um, I have developed the simulation code originally. So um, while Miguel is populating um, this kind of project with a biological significance, um, I'm coming from the fluid dynamical point of view, and we are bringing the best of both worlds together. So we have quite a few works and uh, also joint PhD students together and also a postdoc. And um, I will mention these people later on. Uh, you can also see here uh, Romain, who is also in the audience. Um, uh, he is, for example, a joint PhD student of Miguel and I. So all what I will tell you now, from now on, would not be possible without Miguel and our PhD students and um, postdoc. The first example is red blood cells in bifurcations. And um, you can see this is available on the bioarchive and the paper has just been accepted, but it's still under embargo. So you will see relatively soon where it has been accepted. Um, the motivation for this work is the following. Imagine you have a healthy capillary structure, which you see on the left. You have an artery. You have a number of um, generations of bifurcations. You have the capillary bed. This is where all the magic happens. You have oxygen transfer. Uh, you have CO2 transfer. You have uh, nutrient uh, uptake and so on. And after that, if you go to the right, you have the veins. And veins are basically conduits for the blood. Uh, they are collectors for, for used blood. So these, uh, you find blood cells that don't, that don't have a lot of oxygen left. They're rich in CO2. Um, they are collected by the veins and transported back to, to, the, to the lungs and to the heart. Now, um, the relevance here is that the capillary bed and the normal vasculature, they have a very well-defined structure. So you can see that you have this nice uh, breakdown of blood vessel diameters. It's going from large to small. And any red blood cell that is going through an artery has to go through a capillary in order to reach a vein. No matter which connection you use, you have to go through a capillary. If you look at a tumor, it may be completely different. So in a tumor, you have various numbers of uh, dysfunctions and um, in terms of uh, circulation. And one particular example is a shunt where you have a direct connection between an artery and a vein, which means a lot of blood can actually go through into the vein without having the opportunity to release oxygen to the tissue. You can also see that there are regions here indicated by a hypoxic region where you don't have a lot of um, vasculature at all. And uh, this means that uh, tumors are typically um, not oxygenated very well. 
And you might think naively, at least so this is what I thought at the beginning, I thought, well, if a tumor doesn't receive a lot of oxygen, it's probably a good thing because if the tumor doesn't grow that much, it's not that dangerous and so on, but it's actually the opposite. Tumors get very aggressive when they are not properly oxygenated. And also we know that uh, tumor treatments like irradiation in particular, it is by far not as effective when the tumor tissue is not well um, oxygenated, when it's not well perfused. Uh, this is what you see at the bottom. If you have a poor oxygenation, then you have a low treatment response and the tumor is typically more aggressive. And this is exactly what you don't want to have, right? On the very left, you have an abnormal vasculature. So what we know, we know there is abnormal vasculature in a tumor normally. Uh, we often have a poor oxygenation in a tumor. And the question is, how are they related? What are the mechanisms between the abnormal vasculature and the poor oxygenation? And I gave you a few reasons. One is so that you may have a shunt between an artery and a vein. Another one is so that you have an absence of capillaries, but maybe there's more to that. Maybe the dynamics of the red blood cells is also important. Um, so what we, what we really have to look at is uh, the microstructure of blood flow, right? In this cartoon, you can see, the flow is from the left to the right, you can see that uh, blood as a suspension of red blood cells is moving to a bifurcation and to, then to another bifurcation. And you can also see there is something like a cell-free layer. It's a depletion zone. Um, and that is because at the scale of the blood vessels of interest, blood is not homogeneous. You have certain regions in the bulk of the blood vessel in particular, where you have a much higher density of blood cells or higher hematocrit, and you have the cell depletion layer, which is normally close to the um, endothelium, close to the blood vessel surface, where you don't find any cells or just a few red blood cells. And as you can see, in particular in the second bifurcation here, the shape of the cell-free layer and the distribution of the red blood cells in the blood vessel will determine to some extent how many red blood cells go into which branch. So for example, I don't know if you can see the mouse or not, but if you, if you look at the branch that goes to the top right, the unfavorable branch, it has only a few red blood cells and the favorable branch has quite, quite a few, quite many red blood cells. And uh, this may still be the case even if the overflow rate of blood is the same in both. So what, what I'm saying here is we have to distinguish between the suspension flow rate, which is the total mass transported per time or volume transported per time, both the red blood cells and the liquid between the blood cells, which is called plasma. And we have to distinguish between the red blood cell flow rate, uh, which is basically obtained by just counting red blood cells. And this is what you can see in the equation here. Uh, it basically says that uh, the flow, Q is flow rate. The flow rate of red blood cells in the favorable branch compared to the one in the um, unfavorable branch is not necessarily the same as the ratio of the total flow rate in both branches. And this means we have some kind of phase separation, right? We have an enrichment of red blood cells in the favorable branch and we have a depletion in the unfavorable branch. And um, you could say, well, um, I mean, is it really that important? Um, on the macro scale, it is not important because blood is effectively homogeneous on the macro scale, but the smaller the blood vessels are, you look at, and all, as I told you, all the oxygen and nutrient exchange happens in the capillaries. If you have high confinement effects, then the distribution of the red blood cells determines uh, it's, it's basically the, the main determinant of behavior. Now, the interesting bit here is that um, CFL means cell-free layer. If you have a cell-free layer that is somehow distorted by some kind of mechanism, it could be an upstream bifurcation, it could be an obstacle, it could be a bend in the blood vessel. So let's assume you have a cell-free layer that is different on the left compared to the right of a blood vessel. It usually takes some, some distance for the cell-free layer to recover and that is called the CFL recovery length. And if you non-dimensionalize it by the diameter of the blood vessel, it has been found to be between, depending on resource, between eight and 25. So it takes about eight to 25 blood vessel diameters before uh, all the memory uh, that, that the blood has accumulated from upstream perturbations is lost. Okay, this is how you can imagine this. 
And um, the question is, what is actually the average ratio of this, um, uh, uh, this uh, sorry, what is the average ratio of length between two bifurcations in the human body compared to that development length? Um, and if you, if you look at uh, the data here, here you can see experimental data from uh, experimental partners. Uh, in a healthy human, typically you have a lambda value. Lambda is the average length of a blood segment, blood vessel segment, divided by the diameter of that segment. It's about 70 for a healthy human. In most mammals, um, healthy mammals, it is between 10 and 50. And in most tumors, it is, at least the ones that our collaborators looked at, it is much, much smaller. It's a three to five, right? But I told you, let me go back, that the recovery length is between eight and 25. What is the implication? It means we could, we could assume that in healthy humans and in healthy mammals, um, at a given bifurcation, the blood is distributed in a way that it doesn't know what happened before. But in a mouse tumor, you have a memory effect because the suspension microstructure is still biased by whatever happened upstream. And this should, of course, to some extent at least, uh, modify the distribution of blood cells at the next bifurcation. And this is what we can study in, in simulations, and this is what we've done. Um, here you can see a model system for a double bifurcation. Um, a few parameters here at the top, but the key takeaway message is branch zero is our parent branch. This is our feeding branch. We have the first bifurcation that gives us um, vessels one and two, and we have a second bifurcation that gives us vessels three and four. And the boundary conditions are such that the flow rates in branches one and two are equal, the total flow rate. Uh, so 50% of what you have in branch zero. And the flow rates in branches three and four are also equal, and they are 50% each of what you have in branch one. Okay, so we have two equal splits, two equal bifurcations in terms of flow rate. The only difference is the axial distance between the two bifurcations. So what we wanted to check is, is there actually an effect of distance between uh, successive bifurcations on the distribution of blood cells? This is what we wanted to know. And um, we ran simulations using Hemel B. Hemel B is um, uh, bespoke code that, uh, that we are using for um, complex geometries. Uh, it's based on Lattice Boltzmann, basically the model that I showed to you at the beginning. And um, it's a parallelized code, so we can run it on Archer, for example, and uh, um, we, can, um, uh, we can use it for more complex geometries like the ones you see here. And um, if we start with the extended double T geometry, extended because you have a big distance between the two uh, bifurcations, then you can see that the flow rate or the, hemat the discharge hematocrit, it's basically the flow rate of um, the red blood cells, it's roughly the same. Statistically, it's basically the same um, in branches one and two. There's a slight difference, but uh, I don't want to uh, go into detail now. And also we see that it is roughly the same in branches three and four. And this is what we would naively expect. If the total flow split is equal, then the red blood cell split should naively also be equal, right? Okay, but what happens if we bring the two bifurcations closer to each other? And here we looked at uh, different cases. Um, I show you two of them. One is where uh, the branches are collinear and one is where they are rotated by 180 degrees. So uh, you can see in the right figure that branch four is rotated. And um, we found that suddenly you have a big difference between and a statistically relevant, um, uh, sorry, sig statistically significant difference between the flow rates of red blood cells in branches three and four. In particular, what you can see here is in the middle case, there are fewer red blood cells in branch three and more in branch four. And in the case on the right, you have more in branch three and fewer in branch four. And I will talk about that in a bit more detail on the next slide. So basically it means we get an asymmetric red blood cell split even if the flow rates would imply that the split is the same, which means, um, that the existing models uh, in the literature, which all predict actually 
an equal split in all cases here, these models fail, at least to some extent, when bifurcations are too close to each other. So for us, it means we need a new split model that has some kind of memory effect. And why is it important? Again, we want to develop macroscopic reduced order models so that we are able to work with larger networks of blood vessels. And um, obviously you will have situations where the geometry is more complicated. And we want to understand in which situations do simple distribution laws apply and in which cases do we need more complicated um, laws. And this is one example where we have to revise what has been published in the literature. So if we take a closer look, then you see that um, coming from the left, the red blood cells are nicely distributed and the self-free layer at the top and the bottom, it's basically the same. So you couldn't tell just by looking at the segment on the left, um, which one is up and which one is down, right? Then you get the first bifurcation. And if you look at the red blood cell distribution in the straight branch after the first bifurcation, you can see that the cell-free layer is larger at the bottom and basically non-existent at the top. And this asymmetry doesn't go away before the second bifurcation comes. And this means you have a bias in the red blood cell distribution. And this also means that the branch going up in the second bifurcation will be favored because of the red blood cells are already located closer to the top branch. And this is exactly what we found in our results. There are more red blood cells going into the top branch more than we would naively expect. And also if you look at the branch on the right, you can still see that the uh, cephal layer is pretty asymmetric here. And it takes a bit of distance, um, as I said, eight to 25, in this case, about 25 diameters until we cannot distinguish between the top and the bottom cell free layers anymore. I don't want to go into detail here, but um, in this paper, um, we proposed um, an extended red blood cell split model that can actually deal with this kind of asymmetry that can, um, that can accommodate this kind of memory effect. And that is really the direction we are going into. Uh, but I don't want to, because time is running, I don't want to give you too many details. If you're interested, you can look at this publication. The key outcome is in complex geometries, the simple distribution laws of blood cells don't work anymore, at least not in a very reliable way. And we need better models, and we suggest a better model, uh, to predict how the red blood cells distribute. Um, I don't have that much time left, but let me just um, talk a bit about another work. Um, so um, Charles, uh, he was a PhD student uh, supervised by Miguel and I, and he's now a postdoc in our group. Um, Charles has done most of the work of this particular paper here, uh, where we looked in a bit more detail at the distribution of red blood cells in a network. Let's see how far I can go before I run out of time. Uh, the idea is that you have, um, uh, we, we look at a mouse retina as a model. A mouse retina is a suitable model for understanding how blood vessel networks um, develop over time. Um, if you imagine that you have uh, uh, the microvasculature, you may ask how does the body actually know how the blood vessels should be distributed in space? I mean, how, what is the, the um, scheme behind it? How, how does the body find a good network structure? And of course, there are various feedback mechanisms involved and there's some kind of hidden optimization scheme behind it. But essentially what is happening is that you have a distribution of blood vessels and you will have a certain tissue that is less oxygenated, for example, and this tissue can then release certain chemicals, VEGF, for example, that tell blood vessels to create new branches going in, in another direction. So there's a mechanism, biological mechanism for a blood vessel network to change over time. And in order to understand how this works and what the cues are and the triggers, um, we looked at this particular geometry. So it is essentially a two-dimensional um, blood vessel network it's actually in the simulations, it's three-dimensional. The cross sections are circular of all these vessels, but the topology is basically two-dimensional. And um, we wanted to understand how um, the red blood cell dynamics and distribution inside this network correlates with the temporal development of the network. 
And in a nutshell, the way it works is we get imaging data, which is segmented in figure A. Then um, we generate, or basically Charles has done that, a 3D geometry. Uh, based on that, we run a fluid-only simulation in the segment of the retina, um, because this network is too large to run um, record cells through the entire geometry. Once we know how the um, geometry is perfused in terms of, uh, so basically we can, we can uh, define regions of interest with inlets and outlets, which you can see here in D, this is a, a region of interest, a subset of the system in which we now have a good understanding of where the inlets and outlets are. And then we run a red blood cell simulation in that particular um, geometry. And I just want to show you a video. I hope you can see that. Um, thanks to Charles. So here you can see different regions of interest of the retina. This is also done with female B. And you can see red blood cells distributing, coming from the inlets, disappearing in the outlets. And if you look carefully, you can see a few branches that are not really well perfused. Some of them don't get any red blood cells. Here you have a red blood cell that is stuck, for example. And what you can, of course, do, you can look at all the red blood cell fluxes in all these branches, you can look at the flux of the, the blood as a whole, red blood cell plus plasma. And then of course we can crunch the numbers and uh, we, can see, um, we can see what we find out about uh, this behavior. Now, the interesting bit is, and that's probably uh, the last thing I can explain, um, here our experimental colleagues have been very smart because um, a mouse retina needs to be extracted before you can image it, which means you can have only one temporal snapshot um, at a time, right? Now, how do you get temporal information about the development of a network out of a single geometry? And the answer to that question is you can look at different biological markers. So what you see in figure A here is um, a collagen marker. You can imagine that um, the, uh, each blood vessel is surrounded by a collagen matrix and there are markers that bind to the collagen. And um, the idea is that blood vessels that are not used anymore, which are pruned and disappear over time, which is a well-known mechanism. Um, first, the endothelial cells will disappear. So the blood vessel disappears, but the collagen matrix is still in place and it takes longer for the collagen to disappear. And if you compare the collagen footprint, which is shown in dark red or brown in figure A, if you show that with the actual endothelial marker that is showing where we have endothelial cells, so this is where we really have blood vessels, you can see a difference, right? And you can distinguish between um, luminized vessels. These are, these are vessels which are still open, which are still available for blood flow. You have um, stenosis. Stenosis is where we believe that regression is or pruning is happening. And uh, regression, this is a vessel where um, there is no endothelial cell left, but you still see the collagen matrix. So we believe that we had a blood vessel here in the past, a few days before, but not anymore. Which means we have at least two snapshots in time that tell us this is how it looked before, and this is how the network looks now, okay? And the idea is now to take the red geometry, the one that was earlier, to run red blood cells through and to see if we find any correlation between the red blood cell behavior in that network and the uh, development of the network. And basically what we find here is if you look at the bottom, uh, you can see that in the luminized blood vessels, you have a high flux of red blood cells. We have three regions of interest here, uh, D, E, and F. And luminized means these are the blood vessels that are still open, that have both the endothelial marker and the collagen marker. And the other two categories have basically no or hardly any red blood cells going through, even if they are available for the red blood cells to flow through. And this is what you have seen in the video. So our interpretation is that the blood vessels that don't have a lot of perfusion disappear over time. That is the, the consequence. And that is an important uh, outcome because it tells us that blood flow itself can be a cue or lack of blood flow or lack of blood cells inside can be a cue and a trigger for the tissue to remodel and for blood vessels to disappear. And I think that's a very important outcome.
Um, I could tell you a bit more now about the mechanisms that we believe are important and just maybe this is the last bit I can talk about uh, in the interest of time. Um, if, you, if you ask, how do you know whether a blood vessel, a given blood vessel is perfused by red blood cells or not? Would it be enough to just look at the diameter of the blood vessel? Isn't a smaller blood vessel less likely to be perfused than a larger blood vessel? That's a logical question to ask. So if we look at the data, and that's the data you see in figure A here, uh, x-axis shows diameter and the y-axis shows the difference of normalized red blood cell flux and blood flux. Uh, the solid line here at zero is what we would expect for homogeneous blood. This is if you have exactly the same perfusion of red blood cells you would expect based on the average hematocrit of blood. And whenever you have a data point that is below, it means there is a branch that has fewer red blood cells than you would naively expect. And if the black dot is above the line, it means you have an uh, enrichment of blood cells. And interestingly, you can see there is no clear correlation with vessel diameter. Of course, you see, you see a few vessels here where uh, for the smaller diameters where you have fewer red blood cells, but you can also find quite a few uh, vessels with a larger diameter where you have a depletion of red blood cells. Uh, and what actually counts is the flux of blood going through a blood vessel. But I think in the interest of time, I cannot talk about this in detail. It will take too much time to explain this. Uh, but the important takeaway message is just by looking at the geometry, you cannot say uh, whether a red blood cell goes into a given branch or not. The diameter alone is not a sufficient indicator, which means you need to run a network simulation to see how the red blood cells and how the blood distributes. And only then, based on that data, you can explain what's happening, which is of course a bit of a, bit of a bummer because uh, ideally you look at the geometry and you say, yeah, this branch is not perfused. I, I know that because it's too small or something, but this is not what we can do, unfortunately. Okay, this brings me to um, uh, the summary, but first of all, ongoing work. I, I said I want to say a bit about what we are working on also and to, um, to tell you what uh, you might be working on if you're interested. Uh, Romain, who is also in the audience, uh, he is a PhD student working with Michael and I, and he is looking at the distribution of blood vessels in bifurcations if there is some kind of distortion beforehand. I told you about another bifurcation upstream before in one of the sections in the presentation and Romain looks at some different kind of distortion. And this could be a compression caused by a tumor, for example, if a solid tumor is growing, it will compress blood vessels. So the question is, if a blood vessel is locally compressed and there's a bifurcation, will the compression change the distribution of the blood cells? And um, Romain has nearly finished his first paper, so you should see some results published soon. And also what I mentioned um, at the beginning, um, I'm very excited about a new project together with Manchester. Uh, it's an EPSRC funded project where we look at the blood flow in um, the human placenta. And uh, here Charles, uh, who was a PhD student, who is now a postdoc, um, and Ellie, Ellie just started her PhD project and uh, she's also co-supervised by Michael and I. So you can see there's a lot of collaboration happening. Um, we are looking at, um, uh, we have just started to look at the blood flow in much more complex geometry, so than a simple bifurcation. Um, just to summarize, um, the ultimate aim really is to develop effective blood flow models that are suitable for the macro scale because we cannot run microscale simulations for large organs. It's a, even if we could, it wouldn't be practical to do that on a regular basis. It's much more valuable to develop the insight and understanding to develop reduced order models that can be applied more easily to, to larger networks of blood vessels. Um, you have seen that there is a non-trivial red blood cell distribution in complex geometries, which may be counterintuitive, um, I think it is actually counterintuitive when you see it the first time. Um, we need to characterize the mechanisms behind that. And once we understand these mechanisms in more detail, it is easier to develop reduced order models. But in order to get there, we need cell level modeling. We cannot go without that cell level modeling. Uh, basically, we are, we are working on making the cell level modeling redundant at some point, but right now it is, it is necessary. 
And of course, I want to um, acknowledge also the funders, uh, University of Edinburgh, EPSSC, and uh, European Research Council. And before I forget it, um, I also want to advertise a postdoc position, which is not related to that project I talked about, but um, I have currently a postdoc opening in my group. Deadline is on the 7th of October. Um, if you have any questions about that, you can get in touch, and I'm very happy to point you to um, the application. Uh, but let me go back to the summary and acknowledgements. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and um, I'm very happy to take your questions and answer them.